So today we're looking at uh, the kingdom of God. We're looking at the kingdom of God specifically uh, through, through Mark's eyes. Um, what's Mark's take on the kingdom of God? What does he understand uh, about the kingdom of God? And so the title is The Kingdom of God in the series, but there's a little subtitle um, that I want to bring in. The subtitle is Go Now. Go Now. And I'm going to just read from Mark chapter 1 and verse 15. And this is the start of Jesus' ministry. This is his inaugural speech. And in fact, this is his message. This is what it's all about. And this is what he comes when he preaches his first message. He says this, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come. The kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe the good news. And what Jesus is saying, what we're seeing through Mark's gospel, is the time has come, the kingdom of God is now. It's right now. There's no more time waiting. There's no looking forward. There's no when's it going to come. The kingdom is now. It is right near you. And, you know, the, the Old Testament understanding of the kingdom of God, you won't find the words kingdom of God in the Old Testament, but you will read about the king. You will read about the coming king, that there is a, there is a king of the universe. Um, Psalm 97 says, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. And I love this. I don't know if any of you saw the boxing yesterday. Um, but Tyson Fury, you know, his boast was that there is no man on earth at the moment or has ever been born that can beat me in the ring. That was his boast. He was the king. He was beating everyone. But yesterday, Alexander, um, you sick? I said it right. Come on. He got up and after six rounds began to dominate the fight. And in the end, old Tyson's legs went. He went down and his kingdom was gone. His rule was ended. He came, he saw, he conquered. There's always somebody better. There's always somebody bigger. Doesn't matter how you hold on to the things that you built, someone else is going to come along and take it off of you. And, you know, kingdoms have come and gone. The Roman, em Roman Empire came, and it went. The Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Napoleonic Empire, even the British Empire, it came and it went. And kings ruled over their areas, but they ruled for a season, and then somebody else came. But in the midst of that, the psalmist says, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. You see, the king, the king of the universe, God himself, he rules over an eternal kingdom. There is no beginning, there is no end. So we have the world and kingdoms come and rulers come and they rule over their empires and their countries and and, you know, governments come, governments go, and they disappear because they're worldly and they're earthly, and they may cause us harm, some governments. They may cause us good, some governments. But at the end of the day, there is the earth. There's the earth. There's the earth. But the Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. I don't want to tell you that God is in control. And so, you know, in the Old Testament, they kind of thought that the, that the rule of God or the reign of God, it's going to come at the end of the age when we face judgment. But there's also, you know, the word through the prophets like Isaiah chapter 9. It says, um, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, so there was some understanding that at some point in the future, there was going to come some kind of Messiah. And with him would come kingdom power and authority. And he would reign and he would be God Almighty. And so they were waiting and they were waiting and they were waiting. But Mark's gospel is about the kingdom and the authority and the power of God is now. We don't have to wait. People often say, don't they? You know, oh, well, you know... I, I'll believe in God, I'll turn to God when I'm 90, I'll live my life, I'll do what I want to do, you know, and I'll worry about the kingdom then, you know, and then they get knocked over a bus when they're 72, or they have a heart attack at 65. The kingdom of God is now, the time has come, the time for us to know God is now, 
to know his kingdom is now, to know his power is now, today. And Mark, is his whole message is, come on guys, it's time to go now. There's no longer any waiting. The moment that Jesus Christ set foot on this earth, the kingdom of God set foot on this earth, because he is the king. He is the Lord of Lords. He carries the full power and authority of the kingdom of God. And Mark's, you know, you know, the Old Testament talks about the prophets and the build up and all of the preparation. Mark's not interested in that. He's got 11 verses of preparation. 11 verses. That's all it is. There's all the prophets, there's everything else. But John, but you know, for Mark, it's, it's John came, all right? He came, he's Elijah. And John's message is prepare the way. Because the king is coming. Get ready, because the kingdom's about to come. Get ready, because God's about to do something. And there was the expectation that, oh, you know, in the end, God's going to turn up. In the end, God's kingdom's going to come. But I love the fact, you know, it talks about John's gospel. It talks about John, and it says, he came before you. And the literal Greek word there is the, 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 blah, 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 the word prosopon. And it means... He came before your face. You know, there was the prophets, and we deliberated on that. There was the Talmud. There was the law. There was the Mishnah. There's all the Old Testament scriptures, and we thought about them. We ruminated them. And then came this man, and he was right in your face. He was in your face with a message. God is about to do something. Get ready. Prepare your hearts. The time is coming. 11 verses, that's all we get. And then in verse 15, you know, verse 11, Jesus is baptized. And then he comes and says, the kingdom of God is now. It's now. God's about to do something incredible now. And, you know, preparation's good. It's good to prepare. It's good to get ready. I remember when my kids were little, there are things that they had to do to get ready for school on Monday. They have all weekend to play PlayStation, play football, do what they do. But their homework's got to be done. Their uniform's got to be out. Their packed lunch has got to be ready. And, you know, come half past seven on Monday morning, we've got to drive three miles that way with one kid, seven miles that way with another kid. Then we've got to get on two motorways and get to work for nine o'clock. So come 7.30, it's like, come on, kids, we're going. Oh, I haven't got my homework yet, Dad. We're going now. Come on, it's time. I've got my pat lunch. I've got the uniform. I've lost my PE kit. Too late. We're going. The car's leaving now. And, you know, it's like, you know, we prepare. We get ready. But God's, when God moves, when God opens a new door for us, God says, now, right now. I want you to speak to that person right now. The moment only comes now. You know, I want you to go and pray for that someone to be healed now. And what Mark is saying is the kingdom of God is right now. So my first point today, that was a bit of an introduction, and I'm going to be punching and hitting all over the place, not like Tyson Fury, right, but like the other fella. The time has come now. And, you know, Jesus, firstly, he announces the kingdom of God. He announces the kingdom of God. Right now, the kingdom of God is here. I'm here. Everything of the power of God is in me. And I have authority over all things. God, I love the fact that, you know, as, as, as we surrender to God's kingdom, God speaks to us. God leads us. God guides us. And, you know, when God speaks, we have to recognize that it's God speaking to us. And we have to respond to the kingdom of God. Not delay, not wait. Jesus came to the disciples and he said, leave your nets and follow me. That's now, right now. Right now, I want to do something in your life. Right now, I want you to see the power of God. Right now, I want you to experience the love of God. Right now, I want you to have a relationship with me. He didn't say to them, hey guys, listen, I've got a good idea. Why don't you come and be my disciple? I'll tell you what, you can go away, right? You can think about it. You can sort your nets out, sort your affairs out. Then you can get a whiteboard, right? And on one side, you can put all the pros of following Jesus. Yeah, and on the other side, you can put all the cons of following Jesus. And then you can phone a friend and have a discussion about it. You can go and talk to your rabbi. You can talk to your family. And I'll come back in a month. And if you feel like it's what you want to do, then hey, come on. Why don't we hitch up and we'll go together? No, Jesus said, Leave your nets. Leave, you know, sometimes when God speaks, we've got to leave stuff behind. we just got to step out into what God has called us to do. And, you know, when we do that, we see the power of the kingdom of God. 
we experience God's love and his power and his presence. You know, for Rowan's last birthday, we were like, what do you want to do? She said, I want to go go ape. So we went to go ape in uh, Maidstone. All the kids of the family were there. And when you start off, I don't know if you've ever been, but it's about climbing trees and going on rope ladders and swimming across things. When, they, when you start off, it's only like six foot up. And I'm like, I can do that, six foot up. And I'm walking along these rope ladders and swinging across and going across the cables. But what you don't realize, as you go along, you're getting higher and higher and higher and higher and thicker into the trees and thicker into the trees. And I went across this last rope bridge. And when I got out, I was on this little platform. Now, you're clipped on, like, with a, with a wire. You have to clip on all the time to this, this other wire that goes around there. And I came out this rope bridge, and, and I looked down, and I was about 100 foot up. And I was absolutely terrified. And I was, there was this big tree, and I went like this. And I just grabbed hold of that tree. And I looked down, and like, God only made me 5 foot 5. Yeah, so I should have got the hint. I'm not supposed to be 100 foot in the air. I was made to be close to the ground. And I'm up there, and I'm hanging on this tree like that. I'm terrified. And all these young people, they're all walking past. And, I, and I'm like, not only am I taking up the whole thing, but my backside sticking right out like that. My center bars. And they were climbing over me, moving around me. I'm like, leave me alone. I was about to cry like a baby. And, and all you had to do was come round the other side, clip on to the final rope swing, you know, and you get taken all the way down. And it took me about 10 minutes I was not going to let go of that tree. You know, I was praying. I was thinking about how can I go back, the shame of it. I don't care. And finally, I managed. I worked out a way I could still hold the tree. And if I kept my bum where it is, I could just kind of manage to get all the way around and clip on with one hand like that and then just go backwards and close my eyes. But, you know, the kingdom of God is now. When God speaks, we have to spot, respond immediately. And that's God's message for you today. The kingdom of God is now. You don't have to go to Bible college. It's good if you go to Bible college. Sometimes we spend too much time preparing, too much time waiting. You know, and then when God says now, we miss the moment. We get comfortable. You know, we've got to go to two services. We could wait and wait and wait. But I believe God's saying now, create space for growth. Let's go. God's doing things now. You know, and it helps us to understand that we live by faith. We've got to expect God to do things. So Jesus' announcement is the kingdom is now. And my second point is the kingdom is demonstrated. You know, Jesus did what he said. You know, you saw the power of the kingdom. When a king comes, what does he do? He reigns. He rules. He issues decrees. And people follow those decrees. You know, when we look... In Genesis chapter 1, we see the power of Almighty God. In the first uh, of Genesis, it says this, God spoke, said, let there be light, and there was light. So we see there is power in God's command. He said, let there be light, and there was light. <clears throat> Hebrews tells us that it's by faith we understand that out of nothing by God's command, that which we see was made. God said, let there be light. Isaiah 55 says this, my word that proceeds from my mouth, will not return to me void, but will accomplish that which it was sent to do. And so Jesus came. And when Jesus spoke, he spoke with authority. He came across a man who was demon-possessed. And he said to that demon, be still and come out. And the demon, what responded to what he said? You know, the rabbis had some kind of exorcism. They would pray over people. They would read over people. They would wave candles over people. They would chant over people. They would uh, read from what other rabbis said. But Jesus came down with a demonstration of the power of the kingdom. When he spoke to that demon, he said, be still. And the demon recognized, this is the king of kings. And the demon was silent. And when he said to the demon, get out, the demon left. Because he recognized, this is the king. And we have to surrender to the authority and the power of the king. Can you chuck me a water? Thank you. So Jesus, 
showed his authority that when he spoke, even the evil spirits were subject and submitted to him. He came across a man who was a leper. You know, a leper mean, makes you a social outcast. I don't know if you ever felt like that, like a social outcast. You know, our society has a great way of shaming people, doesn't it? You know, if you're different, uh, you know, it's a great way on Facebook of just shaming people. And of course, you know, to be a leper was to experience shame and social outcast. And he came to Jesus, this leper, and he said, will you, will you heal me? Are you willing? And Jesus said, of course I'm willing. Be clean. And when Jesus said those words, remember, my word, when it goes from my mouth, will not return to me void, but will accomplish what it did. Jesus said, be clean. And immediately the man was clean. Sickness recognized the authority of Jesus. And the man was healed. And Jesus said to him, go back to the priest and show himself to you. You know, show yourself to the priest. But what did he do? He went off and told everyone. <clears throat> I went to Jesus and I've been healed. I went to Jesus and I've been healed. You know why? Because he didn't want to go back to some dead religion. He didn't want to go back to some priest. He didn't want to go back to some faith. He wanted to walk in no church and there was no God there. He'd experienced the kingdom of God. He'd heard the words of Jesus and he'd been changed. And I love the fact that at Jesus' word we can be healed. You know, we had a man in Sittingbourne called Harold who had multiple tumours and he came to church. He had his little box on and he was in palliative care. He was about to die and they released him. Um, just to come to church for one hour, we prayed for him, he went back, and um, we just prayed in the name of Jesus that Harold will be healed, and he went back, and the next day he had his scans, they couldn't believe it, he went into remission, and you know what Harold did when he came out of the hospital, he went through every church in Citybourne and Sheerness, and he said, oh, I went to Net Church in Citybourne, I was dying of cancer, and they prayed for me, and I got healed, 10 years he lived, the cancer never returned. You know why? Because there's power in the name of Jesus. It's not just the name. It's the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is the King and he carries all authority. And when we pray in the name of Jesus, things happen. Disciples were out on the boat and a storm came up. And suddenly they were afraid. And I know what it's like to be out in a boat. And Keely knows what it's like to be out in a boat and be afraid when she's out with me. Especially when we got stranded and had to get the RNLI out. <clears throat> anyway, let's move along. But they were afraid. And then Jesus did this. What did he do? He spoke. He said, winds be still. Just at the word of Jesus, the winds and the waves stopped. And people are like, wow, this is amazing. What authority this man has. He came across another man. I told you I was going to be punching everywhere. Who was, a, who was crippled. And he came to Jesus to be healed. And Jesus said this. He was expecting Jesus to say, be healed. But he said this, son, your sins are forgiven. I just think about that. He came to Jesus to be healed and Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Everything that he had done wrong, all of his mistakes, Jesus pardoned him from his sin. If that man would have died in that moment, he'd have gone to heaven. And you know, that blows our mind because we understand Christian theology. You know that Jesus came to die on the cross. And when he died on the cross, he paid the price for our sins. And God raised him from the dead. And if we believe in Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross, paid the price for our sins, and receive him into our lives, we are forgiven, and we're going to go to heaven. But here's a man, Jesus hadn't even gone to the cross yet, and he said, your sins are forgiven. He pardoned him. Jesus pardoned other people. He, he pardoned the woman in adultery. The thief on the cross, he pardoned him. You know why? Because there's nothing that God can't do. There's nothing that God cannot do. God could pardon everybody in the whole world. Just his word. He said the whole world is pardoned from their sin and they will be pardoned. But you know what? He came and he died on the cross to pay the price for our sin because justice is important to God. 
Because God wants you to know that the price for the things that you've done wrong that separate you from God have been paid for completely. You know, he said the time has come, the kingdom is now. Believe the good news. Do you know that Jesus Christ brings good news for you? I don't know what you're facing. Maybe you're facing financial issues. Maybe you have marriage issues. Maybe you just feel lost. Maybe you're empty. Maybe like me, you suffer from sad syndrome. I was, I was having a conversation with somebody. Anybody else suffer with sad syndrome? Like February, March and April, um, you know, when, when the sun's gone, I get depressed. I wake up down. It's my first thing. I'm a happy chappy. Like wake up the sun, I'm like, oh, great, let's go. Come on, let's do it. Let's go kayaking. Let's go out on the boat. I'm happy. But February, March and April, who is that guy that gets out of bed? Oh, I look out the window, I'm like, oh, it's not like I'm thinking it's a terrible day. My mood goes down and I have to fight it. I have to crash against it. But I want to tell you this, wherever you're facing, there is good news in Jesus Christ for you. Because he's able to take you through all things. Believe the good news. You know, in the Greek, the word for good news is the word euangelion. And it was often used when there was a great military victory. That, and, you know, if you were in a country and another nation was coming against you and there was a war, you know, you were living in fear. <clears throat> because if your country was captured, there's a good chance that all of your lands would be taken away from you. That your family, even your wife and your children, might be taken into slavery. That your crops and your farm will be taken away from you. That you yourself might be taken and forced into slavery in another land. So it was a time of great fear. Where your own king, where your own army, where the sovereignty of your own nation was under challenge. And if a stronger nation came, you would lose everything. But when the battle was won, when the victory was secure, the good news would go out. The enemy has been defeated. You're not going to go into slavery. You can keep all of your property. Your ruler is undefeated. You know, you, he reigns and you are safe. And he uses this same word, believe the good news, that Jesus Christ has come that you no longer need to be separated from God. That you no longer need to be in a place where you're unforgiven and living with guilt and shame. Now nothing has a hold over you because Jesus, it reigns supreme. You know, when we listen to bad news, it has an effect on us, doesn't it? When we listen to things, doom and gloom, it affects us. But when we believe the good news, that whatever we're going through, Jesus is our help. Jesus is our strength. He can speak into our situation, and his word carries authority. Whatever it is, whatever you're facing, you can pray, and you can ask God, and God can send a word, and it can change your situation, because he has all authority. So my third point today is that um, Mark teaches about the kingdom. It's the kingdom announced, the kingdom de demonstrated, the kingdom taught. In Matthew, there are 23 parables. In Luke, there are 24. But in Mark, there are only eight parables. Because, you know, we, we, we heard from Femi, didn't we, the whole thing about Mark and immediately and suddenly. Mark's like, wants to talk about the authority of Jesus, the, the rule of Jesus. If you're facing this, Jesus is going to sort it out. Pray to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. He's going to change everything. And so, you know, there aren't loads of parables. But when you look at the parables in Mark, 50%, half of the four of the eight parables are about the exponential growth of the kingdom. The fact that this kingdom, the fact that this church, God has called it to grow all over the world. Think about the parable of the sower of the seed. You know, he sows the seed. And then whether he goes away or whether he comes back, that seed's going to grow. The, we looked about the mustard seed. It's the smallest of seeds. But suddenly it grows and it, with, with exponential growth. The parable of the talents. You're faithful with 10 things. With the small thing, God will give you 10 cities. Think about the growth from that. You know, you're, you're faithful with 10 coins. 
but now God's going to give you 10 cities. And I love the fact that this gospel, that this message of Jesus Christ is so powerful. It's so powerful that just through a small group of men, 2,000 years ago, the whole world has radically changed. That God can take a hold of one man, one woman, one boy, one girl, and through them, God can exponentially do incredible things. Look at the Welsh revival. Look at the Methodist revival. Look at the revivals that have happened all across our world. One man, one woman has got something from God and has stepped out in faith. And God has caused that to grow exponentially. God's kingdom is about growth. God can't be stopped. His church cannot be stopped. You know why? Because it carries the power and the presence of God. Jesus teaches us about servant leadership. Those who lead in the kingdom. He says, if you want to be the greatest, you must become the servant of all. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom. I was in a prison a little while ago as a chaplain, not as an inmate. Um, <laughs> if they did lock me up, I'd only need a little cell. But I was talking to, to um, another one of the chaplains there, and you know he was from Ireland, and um, he was also a pastor in Ireland, and he was telling me, about this guy that he had in his church. And his name was Patrick Harris. Anybody heard this story before? Patrick Harris, you've read about this. But um, Patrick Harris used to be in the IRA. And, um, you know, probably 15 years ago, we, you know, there was trouble between England and the IRA. And um, Patrick Harris was an enforcer for the IRA. And if you were in Ireland, you paid the IRA, you know, you, you you, you pay tax to the IRA, and the, uh, you had the police force, the Garda, but the IRA kept um, peace in the community by terror. They would shoot your kneecaps out, they would break your kneecaps out, they would beat you up, they would send a message. And Patrick Harris was one of these enforcers for the IRA. He was also a prolific burglar. And one day the law finally caught up with him, and Patrick Harris got sent to prison for burglary, and while he was in prison, a chaplain was just doing the rounds on, on, on the wings and just got talking to him and just had invited him to come to church. And he came to chapel on a Sunday, this hardened, uh, thug, vicious man. And, you know, it, it, it's funny isn't it, when, when we were able to put on a front, you know, especially as men, when you, when you press things down, you know, when you're able to suppress things that have happened to you. You're able to suppress things that you've done. But emotions are, are, are a funny thing. And you can't hide from God. You know, God knows everything about you. He knows your past. He knows your future. He knows your emotions. He saw you when you woke up this morning. He knows everything that's going through your mind right now. And Patrick Harris thought he was just walking into a meeting. And as he began to hear this man talking about the love of Jesus, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, suddenly everything began to well up inside of him. Suddenly he felt the guilt and the shame of all the things that he'd done. And at the end of the service, he went to speak to the minister and just began to break down. He began to sob. He began to talk about how can a God... You know, a loving God, forgive me for all the things that I've done. And as he's weeping and crying, the minister just began to pray for him and, and, and led him in a prayer of repentance, a prayer of accepting Jesus into his life. And Patrick said when he said that prayer, he felt a great weight lifted off of his shoulders. He just felt free. He found Jesus Christ. And even, you know, in a place of prison, he found freedom. And he... Um, would be at every chapel service, he'd be at the Alpha Call. He ended up being um, working in the chapel, helping all of the other prisoners. But while he was there, he had a, a, a girlfriend and he had an eight year old son. And one of these other um, enforcers had moved in with his girlfriend. And uh, there'd been a drunken, violent row. And he had beaten this eight year old boy so badly that he needed facial reconstruction surgery. 
And when Patrick found out about it, he, you can imagine, he felt, he felt like there's nothing he could do. He felt trapped in the prison. He felt rage. He felt anger. All of those emotions that he'd let go began to rise up within him. The man eventually was taken to court and found guilty. He was put in the same prison as Patrick. Patrick got together with some of his friends and he said, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him for what he did to my boy. And they made him a, a shank. They made him a knife. They hid it. They worked out a routine whereby Patrick would be there on the wing. At a certain time, there will be a distraction with the guards. And Patrick was going to kill this man for what he'd done to his son. That night, he was in his cell. And as always, before he went to bed, he knelt at his bed and he began to pray and share his heart with God. I don't know if you've ever done that, but there is power in talking to God and laying your burdens upon him and asking for his help. And as he began to ask for God's help, as he began to talk to God, he began to break down and he began to weep before God. And he said, oh God, I know I shouldn't do this. God, I know it's wrong. But look what he did to my son. And he later recounted that in that moment, he heard the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, look what they did to my son Patrick. In that moment, he had a vision of Jesus on the cross. And he remembered that God sent his only son to die on the cross for him. So that all the things that he'd done could be forgiven. He rose up in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he was able to forgive that man. And I want to tell you that the Son of God came not to be served like an earthly ruler. But he came to serve to lay down his life for you so that you could know forgiveness, so that you could know the power of the kingdom of God, not on your deathbed, but that you could know God right now. And you know, as I finish today, there is a way of the kingdom. There's a way of the kingdom. Jesus said there are two roads. There's the broad road that leads to destruction, and many people are on it. But there's a narrow road that leads to eternal life. And there are few people on it. And right now in this place, at this time, as you've come here, I don't know how you came, maybe somebody invited you. I want to tell you today that Jesus died on the cross for you. That you might know God. That you might know His forgiveness. And I wonder if you would surrender to Jesus Christ today and say, Lord, I want to be part of your kingdom. You don't need a passport. You don't need a visa. You just need to trust in the powerful name of Jesus. And if that's you today, I would like to say just a simple prayer with you this morning. It's just a prayer that acknowledges that maybe you've been living your own life and you've done your own thing. But today, you want to turn away from your sin. You want to turn away from your old life. And you want to know Jesus Christ. You want to be part of his kingdom. Like the man who was pardoned, you want to know his pardon. And you want to live in his power. And if that's you today, maybe we can all just close our eyes. Maybe you would say this simple prayer with me today. Just asking Jesus to come into your life. Just to forgive you for your past. You can say it out loud. You can just say it in your head. He is here. The time has come for you. This is your day. The kingdom is now. Take this moment to receive Jesus Christ as your king today. Here's the prayer. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you died for me that you rose again 
that my past is over. Today, I receive you into my life. Help me to turn away from all those things that I know are wrong. Lead me, guide me, and be with me. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe if you said that prayer, if you would like to go to the hub afterwards, the guys are there to talk to you, maybe to invite you to Alpha. We've got a, a book and some information we would love to give you. And just before I get off the stage today, let me just maybe speak to another group of people. Maybe today, not that you've forgotten, but you've stopped focusing on how powerful the name of Jesus is. He's got a word for you. He's got a word for your life. And if you would just trust in his name, if you would just put your trust in his lordship, if you would understand that now is the time, don't delay, don't wait. Whatever he is calling you to do, do it. You know, he said these signs, it's a kingdom, it's a power, and it's authority that actually is conferred from Jesus to the church. These signs will be with those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will lay hands on sick people and they will get well. That, do you know what? The power of the kingdom is with you as you carry the name of Jesus. So let's go. Let's make a difference in this world. Let's see the kingdom of God come. Let's see people saved. Let's see church grow in Jesus' name.